Valerie? Uh, I'm not that familiar with that uh, international law of armed conflict, but from what I know, I mean, China signed many, many laws, many treaties, but signing them is one thing. I mean, abiding by it would be another thing. Uh, so law is static, but ethics is, uh, is dynamic. So for me, I think the, each, the, the crucial issue is still whether the Chinese Communist Party and the PLA are willing to embrace just war ethics wholeheartedly. And that's the second part of my presentation was on this topic. If they are willing to embrace just war ethics wholeheartedly, then naturally they will be in that direction of I mean, trying to abide by these international law. I think um, in response to your, to your first question, um, you know, India is a signatory to most, most of these international agreements as well. Um, and there are two uh, further points, right? One is in, in the 1960s, there was in India a pretty large discourse among international lawyers in India about the relationship between international law and sort of traditional Indian laws and customs. Um, and it was partly to sort of make the point that these are not colonial laws that India is signing on to, that these are, are uh, laws that reflect broad humanitarian principles that we can all sign on to. So there's a tradition there of trying to, to bring um, traditional, classical, ancient Hindu ideas um, into line with, with the laws of war, and they're not seen as being, being in tension um, by that group of scholars. Um, secondly, in a way, if you, if you think about the, the structure of the mandala system in the classical argument, there's an idea that this is a little bit like the international order and a concern with some sort of international order. Um, and you could imaginatively make the king in the middle of the United Nations or something like that. Um, and there's certainly been um, among Indian scholars who do work on international law, um, a lot of, of interest in working through the United Nations and sort of building up international um, communities and organizations. Um, on your second question about who this is addressed to, you're right, this, these texts, well the legal texts and the, um, and the princely mirrors sort of texts are obviously aimed at the Kshatriya caste. Um, and the, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and those sorts of, of, of scriptural texts um, are, are aimed at everyone, right? Um, so I think that, that texts like the Mahabharata are in a way justifying the whole of Hindu ethics, justifying the caste system and so on to, to the whole population. And, and insofar as they have rules about fighting, they're also telling everyday people what should be acceptable, what you should see, right? Uh, if, if a good king is fighting in a good way. Um, modern India obviously, by law, no longer has a caste system, right? So. Um, in practice, that's not exactly true, but legally speaking, there's no caste system. So if one tried to imagine who it would now be speaking to if you picked up the text, the Kshatriya can't, it can't be thought of as existing as a caste from the point of view of, of, of the government, um, but the Kshatriya could represent everyone in the armed forces. So there's a way in which it could be fairly easily um, moved into being a, a modern text by, by just shifting from calling them the Kshatriya or kingly caste to calling them members of the, of the armed forces. I don't think that it's logically problematic, right? But obviously that's not who the text was, was aiming at. So could I just make one comment about why I asked that question about international law? It's, it's the clash of civilizations question. Uh, James Brown Scott back in the 40s, uh, who was the first one that really did a, a serious study of, of uh, uh, ethics of war and, and uh, rules of war in different cultures argued that where you have the boundaries is where you find the, that is this, this group and this group of different traditions, is where you find the wars that are hardest to restrain. And, uh, and so I'm, I, was, I was really probing uh, uh, at whether, uh, the, whether the, the common allegiance to the international laws of armed conflict exist uh, from the perspectives of these three cultures and, and uh, thus undercut the idea that at, uh, at the of Could we just uh, lump that answer with uh, uh, Professor Tesson? He's been waiting patiently, and perhaps uh, there'll be additional comments to that point. That wasn't a question. That okay. Was a I, I just have a brief question for John. Uh, John, uh, the second group that you mentioned, uh, the predecessor of chaos methods, uh, this is a group that nevertheless agrees with Al-Qaeda with the goal of establishing divine government, right? My question is, is this 
uh, group, whoever they are, not the children they are, but whoever they are, this group that argues this, does, does it argue that divine government should be established by an ethical war, that is a war that abides, that, is, that, that does not resort to terrorist methods, or does it argue that divine government should be established by persuasion? No, okay. Well, it's not a single group. Now, I was grouping together a certain kind of criticism that's articulated by a number of people. And the ones I was thinking of do seem largely to believe that um, it will not be possible in the current circumstance to achieve the goal of establishing a legitimate Islamic state without resort to force. They do seem to believe that. Now, if, if we weren't so focused, uh, if, if I wasn't focusing here on military ethics and uh, notions of war, uh, I would have talked about some groups of people who share the goal of governance by divine law in some broad sense, but who insist that military means are inappropriate. There are such people. Um, so uh, there is a broader category here. Uh, it, it's worth saying, too, when, when you give a short talk and you're trying to identify these types of criticisms, um, this second group grouping of people, I would say, agree on the notion of governance but by divine law. But since texts are notoriously um, malleable, uh, all the particulars of divine law can be matters of debate. So you could have someone who insisted on this as a goal, but who argued that in some sense uh, the text pertaining to, say, inheritance laws for women that are outlined in Quran chapter 3 uh, aren't to be understood as something that can kind of be plopped onto a 21st century society. Uh, so you can have some uh, dissent and argument even within the agreement on that overarching notion of governance by divine law. Yeah. Our hosts have graciously allowed us another five minutes because we uh, kicked yeah. off a little bit late. So we had a question behind the pillar and then we're gonna come over to Bill. Uh, hey, thank you. Um, actually, I'd love to hear from all the camps on this, but uh, in the interest of time, um, I'd like to direct this to, uh, to the Chinese case. Um, so acknowledging that there's a, uh, a gap between uh, Western just war theory and and uh, and scholarship, and, and how the West actually prosecutes its wars, uh, I, I was wondering about the relationship between uh, Chinese just war canon uh, and the extent to which that canon actually uh, informs and constrains when and, and how. Uh, Chinese, the Chinese look at war and how they fight and prepare for war today. In the past, I mean, the, that set of canons uh, uh, do have that, I mean, uh, a binding force on uh, the, uh, uh, how wars uh, is supposed to be fought. But as I, in, uh, in the second half of my presentation, I'm saying that right now we're living in a post-canon age. So the authority of the canon has diminished and also it's a fragmented canon right now. So right now, as it is, I mean, these treatises do not by themselves have any binding force. It's an entirely the kind of a pick and choose attitude. You think you think this is valuable, then you, uh, you 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 abide by it. Otherwise, you can just ignore it. So this is uh, the situation right now. So there's no uh, uh, direct uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, inst instructive force uh, from these from the canon to the actual behavior of the PLA today right now. But I, my, my hope is that, that the PLA establishment would eventually uh, would retrieve and also would inherit the full uh, just war ethics that are present in these seven, seven treatises and would treasure them in such a way that they would become their own ethics uh, and then to, be, to have self-restraint that way uh, by uh, appealing to, the, to, to their own just war ethics rather than to the just war ethics of America, for example. Bill, I think you'll have a last question. Uh, this is sort of an extension of uh, Jim's question. I think PC already answered it, so it'll be addressed to, respectively to John and uh, Valerie. Uh, John, can you say anything about the influence of Islamic thought on uh, contemporary 
thinking of, of, of the professional military, either in Islamic countries or in secular countries like Turkey with the Muslim majority and Valley. Likewise, it, it, the same thing at all about the influence of Hindu thought on contemporary professional military thought in India. Um, interesting question. The, the things I'm familiar with, um, say uh, a, um, a pamphlet studied by the Egyptian military and to which they are accountable. Um, this is from, oh, the 1970s. Uh, quotes a few Quranic verses and Hadith reports here and there, but uh, by and large is salted with things that would probably be recognized in terms of uh, the law of armed conflict. Um, that would be a source of criticism on the part of the people I was focusing on today, who after all are not a professional military force by definition. I mean, in some ways they've made a career out of fighting, but they're not, they're not a professional military force. Um, I do also know uh, that it, it's kind of a hobby uh, in parts among military officers in parts of the Muslim world to study the battle tactics of the prophet and that sort of thing, but that's another kind of stuff, yeah. Well, um of two answers. One is that in terms of political discourse or public discourse, Hindu ethics are off the table in India, right? So it's a non-starter to use the Hindu tradition in an official capacity to explain why one should, should fight in a certain way. Um, so it would be difficult to sort of imagine any sort of official context in which that could be, uh, could be seen. That being said, um, there are sort of a cottage industry of publishing in India, um, of small monograms that are often by ex-military officers about the same sorts of things John was mentioning about sort of wise ideas you could get from, from uh, reading these uh, advice to princes. Um, and a similar thing exists for sort of wise business ideas that come from those. Um, but I don't know how big their circulation is. Right. It seems that they come from small presses, so it's maybe someone's personal hobby to, to do some reading and write them up. Um, in terms of political discourse that is not happening within the official establishment, um, Hindu ethics are brought to bear on the, the discussion sometimes um, of nuclear weapons and proliferation in newspapers um, in, in two opposing directions, which is, which is really intriguing. So one direction sort of suggests that um, India is a great power. The other great powers are nuclear, nuclearly armed. Therefore, uh, we should continue in this direction, and and there should be, you know, sort of no opposition to it. The other side um, suggests, well, we're concerned about the possible effects of nuclear weapons, and since um, we we couldn't actually use nuclear weapons against against uh, states that don't have them, then we should push for disarmament. Um, and, and think of, of sort of other ways of dealing with our grand strategy. Um, so it, it exists in sort of this discourse on the newspaper journalistic editorial level, but not on a, on a governmental level. All right, I'd like to thank the panelists and all of you for your insights and stamina. <laughs>